Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. We are now moving on to mass spectrometry based data analysis and in this light a new method which involves data independent acquisition or DIA will be discussed today. DIA is an MS technique which involves fragmentation of precursor ions within a selected M by Z range. It differs from data dependent acquisition or DDA where only selected precursor ions based on their abundance are fragmented. In this lecture, Dr. David Campbell will introduce you to the concepts of Swath MS, a type of data independent acquisition or DIA method and the various tools available for analysis of such data. So, let us now welcome Mr. David Campbell from the Institute for System Biology, Seattle. So I'm going to talk about basically SWATH MS and in particular some tools that we use to, to ensure that the libraries that we use for SWATH MS um, are robust. Um, that was initially going to be the focus is this one tool, but as I sat through the talks and as, as uh, the schedule changed a little bit, I broadened it to, to include more sort of general SWATH information. Um, I'd like to actually, before I begin, thank some of the people that um, there we go. Um, so, so Mukul has done most of the mass spec work that I'll talk about. Uh, Dr. Robert Moritz uh, is the, la the lab head and uh, they both of them helped prepare some of the slides that I'm going to show. So I'd like to thank them in advance. Um, so basically this is an overview of the talk. Um, so first of all, I'm going to try to tell you what SWATH is, DIA or SWATH and why you would want to use it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, SWATH Atlas and Peptide Atlas and some related resources that are out there that you can use. And you've, again, you've already heard about some resources. There's a lot of people working and trying to make this data available. Uh, somebody that can use that, somebody that can take what's already available and leverage it for their own research is going to be ahead of, it, uh, ahead of their competitors. Then I'm going to talk about the specific tool and, and a little bit about what it might be in an ion library that would, would, we would want to make sure is proper so that we can be confident in our SWOTH analysis. And finally, I'm going to give you a, a short example of a SWOTH analysis and uh, to try to illustrate some of the points that, that I've discussed. <clears throat> and I, I will say that along the way, I'm going to take a detour that, that occurred to me uh, during Dr. Mani's talk yesterday. So this is, this is a, a depiction of SWATH MS. Um, and so each of these cylinders represents a proteome. The top of the cylinder is basically uh, more concentrated or uh, more, uh, yeah, basically more concentrated proteins, um, say in the micromolar range. And down at the bottom is very dilute uh, proteins, say in the femtomolar or atomolar range. And these are the different techniques uh, for mass spec proteomics. And um, I'd just like to go through them briefly and, and give an illustration of some of the pros and cons. Um, so the one that we're most familiar with is called DDA. And so basically what you do is, as the peptides are eluding from the column, you, you pick, generally speaking, the most intense one, you fragment it, and then you interpret those fragments. That's a spectrum. And that's typical uh, proteomics. Uh, that's very good at seeing pretty much everything. So yeah, basically it's from most concentrated to least concentrated and from side to side basically means how many of the chemical, the, of the ions at that level you've been able to see. So DDA sees, DDA sees everything that's very concentrated. Um, if you then, instead of basically selecting the most uh, abundant precursor, if you instead have a, an inclusion list, a set of, of precursors that you're looking for to begin with, you can actually get deeper into the proteome, but it comes at a cost of losing some of the coverage at the higher concentrations. SRM, which was uh, explained well this morning, uh, is, carries that trend further still. It's very sensitive, um, but because you have a limited number of precursors you're trying to select, um, you, you necessarily, the mass spectrometer has to spend more time uh, basically finding the, the fragment ions of interest. And so you don't see nearly as many things, but you see them much more sensitively. 
Yes, yeah, so that is generally correct. So almost all of these techniques that require sort of precursor information, they generally, generally rely on originally on DDA experiments. And there's a number of ways you can get deeper into a DDA experiment by doing fractionation, by uh, doing longer gradients, um, by doing different cell types, by doing subcellular fractionation. So basically, by really beating this technique to death, you, you come up with inclusion lists for this, for this, and it turns out for swath. So swath also, in the main way it's analyzed, depends on previous information. Um, so the, the benefit, so swath doesn't get quite as, um, it's not quite as sensitive as SRM, but you can see that basically it, it analyzes everything. And that's because whereas these three techniques, they basically, again, they, they, there are peptides eluding, you select one, you fragment it, and you interpret it. With swath, basically you're taking chunks, um, and, and it, I'll go through sort of how we decide to do that, but you're taking big chunks of M to Z ranges, which contain hundreds and even potentially thousands of peptides, and you fragment them all. So you have fragmentation information on pretty much everything in your sample. So right now you're only limited by the sensitive, sensitivity of the instrument. Um, obviously in the future we'd like to be able to analyze every peptide in the entire proteome, plus you know, any post-translational modifications, but, but it's not clear how we're going to get there, and, and we're certainly not there yet. So yeah, so the, the advantages of SWATH are you get greater depth than DDA methods, you get more consistent breadth, the broadness across um, seeing all the proteins at a given level, and you're able to reanalyze the data pretty much forever. Um, so the, the idea is that you, uh, because you're essentially fragmenting everything, you have information about everything. With these techniques, you've selected nine and fragmented, so you only have partial information. So this one, you have complete information that you can reanalyze forever. So this is a depiction, uh, uh, basically this was gone over well this morning, but in SRM, you essentially have many chemical species eluding at a given time. You use one of the quadrupoles as a filter to, to filter out this particular ionic species. You collide it with a collision gas, and then you um, sequentially uh, zero in on individual uh, Q3 or, or fragment ions um, to make an MRM assay. In contrast with SWAT, basically, again, you have all these things eluding. Everything else is the same. Everything's eluding the same. Uh, you fragment multiple species at a time, actually many more than are depicted here, and then you read out all of the fragments and you get a very convoluted or complicated spectrum at the end. Um, so this is a depiction of just how complicated it is, and it also shows how swaths work. So basically, the distance between here and here is called one cycle. So initially you do one precursor scan to see what MS1 things you have. And then you step across a predefined mass range as quickly as you can. And in this case, we're de we've depicted 25, um, 25 Dalton swath windows, um, fixed width all the way across. And then we go back. So that's one cycle, ba -ba 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 -ba, back, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, but you have to consider how peptides loot. Peptides are coming off of the column and they, they start eluding, and there's a maximum, in a, and then they come back down to baseline. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so ideally, you would get multiple points across this peak. And because you're taking all of your time doing all these di different swaths, you run the risk of, of not getting data for across every peak. So these are, this basically depicts, um, in time versus MZ space, the fragment ions coming from just this one swath. Um, so these are not the precursors, even though the, the upper end of the range is the same. These are actually the fragment ions. And the fragment ions in any one sort of vertical slice are likely to be related with each other. Um, you see this smear across here. Um, this is because this fragment uh, width corresponds to the, the precursor width. And this is bleed over of precursor into your fragmentation spectra. And for this reason, when you make a library, you actually exclude any Q3s that are within the, the swath window that you initially used, simply because there's so much background. Um, so this is a depiction of the actual swaths that were used. You see it goes from 4 to 425, then 424 to 450. So there's a little bit of overlap in each of these cases, as you see. 
and basically there are 32 identical windows, and then you go back again. But it turns out <clears throat> that, that that was the initial way things worked, but the instrumentation uh, companies came up with improvements in the software and the way the instruments worked. And in fact, uh, it turns out that if you look at sort of normalized M to Z space, there are a lot more chemical species that have M to Z ranges between four and 400 and 1,000 than out beyond here. So really what you want to do is have a variable swath windows. And so you see down here where there's, you know, it's still going up, you have a width of about six or seven units. But by the time you get into this regime, it's, it's, only, it's just six. Um, and so the, the minimum width would be right at this peak. And then when you get out here, your, your width might be, you know, 100 or something like that. And the idea is to try to, to make sure that there's the same number of precursors in every window so that you can give your machine the, the best chance to, to analyze everything. Um, and basically, so our, our swath um, setup uses 100 uh, different windows. And so you can imagine that the machine has to be pretty fast to step over that. So because the, the output is so complicated, you need a high-resolution mass spectrometer. So you need high-resolution MSMS, or else you'll have no way to really distinguish what you're seeing. You need a fast cycle time, because you're going over all of these swaths. You need to be able to get up and down so that you get reasonable sampling over any one peak. And so this is, this is a, an idealized uh, peptide elution profile. Um, and, and of course, in reality, these things are all overlapped. I mean, at any one time, many things are, are eluding. Uh, so if you take human cells, there, there are something like 800,000 different, or something on, on that order, different possible peptides. And you think you're eluding them over 90 minutes um, off this column, even if you, you know, figure you're not going to have half of them there, that's a lot of things eluding at any one time. Um, and also, a, a rational selection of these Q1 ex windows, as I described, these variable width windows, goes a long way towards uh, a successful outcome. So how do we analyze SWOT data? So most of the data that um, is used uh, is depicted in the top row, and that's library-based uh, analysis. So we take DDA data, we make a spectral library, and then we use a spectral library to put it into format usable by all these different software tools. Um, Skyline has its own methodology for doing this, uh, as does PeakView. So a number of tools can, can do this conversion for you. But as was pointed out, that requires that you do DDA runs. So ideally, when you want to go do a swath experiment, you wouldn't have to go and run 50 or 100 DDA runs just so that you can make a library to analyze your samples. I mean, what if you're looking at 1,000 human samples or, or a whole bunch of different uh, animals perturbed in different ways? You know, it really wouldn't be reasonable to go and, and make all these libraries just for this one-time use. And so we advocate the use of these repository libraries that can be used to do these analyses. Um, so, so our software can read and write any of these formats. Um, there's also another way, a, a library-free uh, method. And this one is from ISB. It's in the transproteomic pipeline. It's called DISCO. And it's the Data Independent Signal co uh, Correlator. Um, so basically what it does is, at any given time, it simply looks at the fragmentation pattern. And it, it looks for signals that are rising and falling in concert, in unison. And it assumes that those belong to the same chemical species, the same, uh, the same peptide. It also uses these precursor scans to watch the, MS, the precursors come up and down. And it essentially makes a, a pseudo MZML. I, I don't know. So MZML is a, is a common file format that is used for um, encoding proteomics data. So everybody has different instrumentation. Some people have thermo instruments. Some have AB -SIX. Um, So MZML is an attempt to, to make, take all these independent and different vendor formats and put it in a single format that people developing software can use. Um, and so what DISCO does is it basically it mimics a DDA run, and then you do a normal search, and you come up with results. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Peptide Atlas and Swath Atlas. So Peptide Atlas is uh, something that's open, hosted at the ISB. And basically what it does is it takes mass spectrometry experiments from all over the world and imports them and analyzes them in a consistent way and comes up with highly, um, 
highly curated uh, sets of, of peptides and, and highly confident sets of peptides. It's, it's actually very, uh, we, we try, strive for very low error rate. As a consequence, we throw out a lot of data, but, but the data that's in Peptide Atlas is actually very good. And it's broken down by tissue type, by organism, and it's searchable. And it's, it's a reasonable first place to start if you're embarking on a proteomics experiment. Um, if you, if you want to do uh, proteogenomics and you don't have um, the, tech, the, the know-how to basically do analysis of certain cell types, you can actually get some expression data directly from the Peptide Atlas that may be useful. So Peptide Atlas is sort of the umbrella, um, the umbrella property or the umbrella uh, service here um, at ISB. Um, there's also something called SRM Atlas, where we've basically, a similar vein, we've taken SRM data from various labs, and we've compiled it and made it available for people to use and built an interface so that people can look at it. Um, and Swath Atlas, uh, again, is yet another data type. So the, the first one, Peptide Atlas, that's DDA data. SRM Atlas is SRM data, and Swath Atlas is Swath data. Um, Peptide Atlas is by far the most developed. Um, SRM Atlas and Swath Atlas provide some searching interface so that you can get the data that you want and hopefully uh, render it in some way that's useful for you to do an experiment down the road. Both of these two sort of generate the inputs for experimentation on your own. Um, and we use a common code base and a common backend database to, uh, to make these. Um, so I would be remiss if I don't mention the human SRM Atlas. So this was an effort in Rob Maritz's lab to basically uh, cover all the, all the proteins in the proteome, the, the then known proteome. Uh, and to do that, we basically took Uniprot and made at least five, for five peptides for every protein based on things that had been seen in the past. And we actually used synthetic peptides. So these were, were made so that we had a high confidence of what we were, we were looking at. Um, and then for longer peptides, we took up to 10. And basically, this, this gives us an ability to look in theory, across the entire proteome. Um, in addition to that, we did two other things that I think are useful in the context of proteogenomics. So one of which is we looked at all the different variable spliced uh, protein forms and picked peptides for those proteoforms. And we also looked at uh, about 5,000 well-conserved SNPs. So um, we, have, we have peptides for a lot of different things, and it's possible that uh, that would be useful in the context of proteogenomics. Um, so SRM Atlas, this represents what you would happen if you had done a search for, say, this protein. Um, each one of these lines represents an SRM or MRM assay. An assay is basically a Q1 value, a Q3 value, so a, a precursor M to Z, a fragment M to Z, and retention time, um, as well as a, a relative intensity so that you can rank it relative to its, its neighbors. Um, we have all these links. You can look at spectra and chromatograms. Um, so this is, we, we did all these different collision energies. So for this QTOF, uh, so that for any given uh, protein fragmentation, there's sort of an optimal collision energy. We actually looked at all these different collision energies. And you can see that the, uh, the behavior of the fragment ions uh, as a collision energy changes. Um, this is an example of a chromatogram. This is following one of these links. And also, of course, you can see spectra in here. The Swath Atlas uh, right now has, has really three functionalities. So first of all, it's a repository. There's, we have several, uh, several different libraries um, from different uh, organisms, uh, rat, human, a uh, number of uh, bacterial organisms. Uh, the biggest one that we have is this so-called pan-human uh, library. Basically, it was an exhaustive uh, effort done in Rudy Abersold's lab. To, to sequence um, some 60 different samples, a number of cell lines, a number of primary tissues, um, a number of fractionation techniques uh, that came up with, with basically assays for well in excess of 10,000 uh, human proteins. And so we also allow people to basically Using one of these libraries, it turns out that different people have different experimental setups. And so using one of these libraries, you can provide certain information as in which proteins you want or which mass ranges you want to use. And you can basically make a subset library that is more uh, amenable to your research. Um, and we also have this uh, tool, which I'll talk a little bit about, 
which is, uh, which is an assessment tool for an ion library. So you can take anything. So you can make your own ion library in Skyline, and maybe, maybe you're not getting the results you wanted. Well, you can take it and upload it here, and it will give you some feedback on exactly what's in the library, and you can see if there's something that, that indicates why it wouldn't be working properly. Um, and once you do this, you get this very complicated output, which I will break down a little bit so uh, it doesn't look so daunting. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about this assessment tool. So this is sort of the, the workflow of creation of libraries and then swath analysis. Um, so this here, the simple sample prep digestion is, is what was talked about at length yesterday. I mean, you have to get the samples. You have to figure out how much protein is there. You have to know, you know what kind of contaminants you have. Um, you may do fractionation. So there's, there's a, an awful lot of work. I mean, it's, it's easy to put it on a flowchart, but there's an awful lot of work that goes into this. Uh, then at some point, somebody does DDA and uh, uses a search engine, and you come up with a validated set of identified spectra. Those spectra are then uh, combined into a spectral library, a consensus spectral library. And what you do is you basically take all the observations of a particular peptide ion. So a peptide ion is a peptide plus any modifications plus a charge. So if you have the same peptide in plus two and plus three, that would be two entries in the spectral library. And it turns out when you're doing mass spec, you often have noise in your peaks. And by combining all the different uh, occurrences of a given uh, spectrum in your data, you actually attenuate the noise because peaks that are real will tend to add up, and peaks that are, are just background noise will tend to attenuate. And so this consensus library is really the basis for all of the, all of the sort of inclusion lists, all of the library-based um, techniques. So this can be taken and made into an SRM library directly with Spectrast, or it can be made into an ion library. And so an ion library is what we call the libraries that are used with SWATH MS. Um, and then we can basically take this ion library, and, and generally we make the ion libraries as complete as possible, and then we apply our own uh, particular uh, criteria. So every time you do mass spectrometry, you have, to, you have a, a mass range that you're looking at. You may have a, a preferred sort of B or Y ion composition. So you can apply these kind of filters and make an appropriate subset for your data. Um, and then, of course, you do your DIA analysis with one of the tools that I mentioned. So one thing that I decided during Dr. Mani's talk, it seemed like a lot of people were a little confused. And I think that for this audience, so, so it turns out that the Spectrast, TPP Spectrast, MS Proteomics tools, as well as this, uh, this data set, are available on Docker. So Docker, I think for people that don't have a lot of software background, I mean, by all means, if there, is, if there is a platform that you can use that, like Galaxy that has everything built in, use it. But if you want to download something onto your computer and run it, Docker is an excellent way to do it because basically all of the maintenance is, is handled for you and all you have to do is run it. And I thought I'd explain a little bit more what, what it is. So you can see that this is meant to be sort of a container ship and these are containers. But really, the, the whale is a computer. And it could be your computer. It could be a server in your department, but it's just a computer. But it's, what it's doing is it's running these little mini computers on it. And, and these running mini computers are called containers. Um, so basically, it runs a, a guess on a guest computer um, a, on a host computer. So it, it runs one or more little guest. It's almost like a little computer on a, a host computer. So what you, there are two concepts in Docker. So the first is images. It's like, it's like a hard drive. So basically, it has an operating system like Linux. It has some software. So it knows how to do one thing really well. But it's just a file. It's, just, you know, it's handled by the Docker software, but it's just a file. When you actually start the Docker, that's when you get a container. And that's what uh, Dr. Mani was talking about. Oh, so I lost a couple. Um, so basically, uh, so, so you, can, you could have a little hard drive uh, icon if it was showing up for, for sort of all of these things. So you could have on your computer, you could have a Protege container or a image. You could have a TPP image. And you could have a FireCloud image. But the neat thing is, on any given computer, you can actually 
run many of these things. And so the images is just sort of this set of instructions. It's like a little computer that you can run on your computer. But you can, you know, you can distribute it. Uh, you, we were talking about FireCloud. Basically, they can take and they can put their software, this little container, on as many nodes as they want. Um, and so, or you could, you could run multiple jobs on your own computer. So, the, and, uh, so anyway, it's, but why is it so neat? And so, so I think from a, from a non-software expert perspective, I think that the neatest thing about it is that the developer takes care of it. So you guys tried to uh, install RStudio and Prodigy, and you had issues with the versions of R. So I'm actually responsible for, for maintaining different versions of R and Python at, back at our, at our um, lab. And it's really a headache, because basically some really smart postdoc in your lab makes some software that you want to use. But he's gone now, or she's gone now. And it, it depends on Python 2.6. And then somebody else comes along and says, oh, I have this new software I want to run. They download it. They say, oh, I have to upgrade Python. And now all of a sudden, the old thing doesn't work. So what Docker does is, is everything is, is separate. And so it basically, it's, there's no contamination of the environment. And it may seem like a trivial thing, but that really is one of the biggest headaches, is the fact that all these software things have their own dependencies. And by having the developer maintain the environment, it it's makes it much easier. Uh, so there's no conflicting versions. So basically, each Docker knows what it does, and it does it well. Um, the updates are generally lightweight. So the first time you download something, maybe it, it's a gigabyte. It takes you five minutes to download. But the next time somebody just made a little tweak to it, you just say, oh, I want to get the latest thing. It looks, and it, it does it w by what is called layers. And it says, oh, I already have that. I already have that. Oh, I have to download this one new thing. It takes 20 seconds, and boom, you're running the latest and greatest. And so it's really convenient way to update and keep your software updated. So it can run virtually anywhere. It can run on your computer, department server, or as we heard yesterday on, on the Google uh, Cloud or Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services. And was also, what was also asked yesterday was, can I modify it? So it turns out, yes, you can download any Docker, well, almost any Docker. You can start it up interactively, and you can make changes. You can put your own software on. You can, add a little pipeline, and then you can save it as an image. And then next time you go in, you can basically run that image. You have that container. And you don't have to update it again. Um, so the one thing that I should point out is you can run these on your computer. But it's not a miracle. If your computer is slow, the Docker on your computer is going to be slow. It doesn't make you suddenly have a supercomputer. But if you have a reasonable uh, computer, you can run some pretty complicated software. And, and there's not a lot of overhead running the container. So it, it would run just about as fast as if you installed it yourself and, and took care of the headache. So anyway, um, so what, what runs on Docker? Well, as we heard yesterday, um, the Fire Cloud. Uh, you guys also heard a, a presentation about BaseSpace. Well, it turns out BaseSpace, these are all, all Docker images that each one of these little apps is a Docker image that runs on Amazon Web Services. And in fact, they have a thing uh, for proteomics called One Omics, um, uh, Illumina does. And basically, we've developed a couple apps, and, and they're basically Docker containers. And the, the reason they do that is it's very easy. Everything is all self-contained. They don't have to worry about collisions of all these different software packages that they're, they're offering. Um, the TPP runs on Docker. OpenMS runs on Docker. That's one of the things we use to analyze Swath. Python, R, you guys were having trouble with R. You can download any version of R you want, and then boom, it's, it's running. Um, there's also this thing called uh, biocontainers. And the biocontainers folks uh, basically maintain all these different tools. Uh, SAM tools is, is a big uh, genomics tool for doing alignments. And um, basically, it's one of the tools available in Galaxy. Uh, and this is. Uh, this is an easy way. So these are basically biosoftware that are maintained that you don't have to do anything. You don't have to go searching for them. You can just go to this one place and look and see, is it, does it have anything that I want? Anyway, so that's the end of the sermon. I think Docker would be neat. I think, I think it's worth checking out. In today's lecture, 
you will introduce to the greater depth and consistency of data independent acquisition or DIA method over data dependent acquisition or DDA method. Softwares like Skyline, Spectronaut, PeakView and OpenSwath they require a library for DIA data analysis. Softwares like Disco and DIA Empire they do not require the library for DIA data analysis. The softwares Disco from ISB mimics DIA runs like a DDA run. It performs normal search and interprets the results. Resources like Peptide Atlas, SRM Atlas and Swath Atlas they contain information from DD experiments, SRM experiments and DIA experiments respectively. These resources are freely accessible to the research community and contains lot of valuable information. The dockers let the users analyze data from multiple places and offers an easy interface and workflow for data analysis. In the next lecture, we will look at some key features of Swath Atlas and how it can be used to accelerate DI data analysis. Thank you.